All right. So hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our our burb burb edition. Burb time. Of burb time. Behavior chat. Burb time. Um, so uh, I'm sure you all are here because you saw the announcements. Um, not that you randomly showed up here for any reason. Um, but um, otherwise, uh, we have myself, um, Emily Strong, and Stephanie Edlin. And uh, hi. Oh, look, somebody showed up from Australia at like six or seven in the morning. Very hi, nice. Lee. <laughs> hi, Lee. <laughs> and you can type into chat, uh, as I mentioned. Otherwise, right. ooh, you're, that means you're in over... What is it? Six thirty in Adelaide is six Perth. Are you in Perth? Um, it's seven a.m. right now in Sydney, Brisbane. Brisbane. Oh, okay. Brisbane. Oh. I was supposed to be in Brisbane. Yeah, you will need. Steph and I were supposed to be in Brisbane. Let's, Maybe let's not year. talk about who's supposed to be in Australia. Right? <laughs> I think you win for the saddest story. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So, unfor my my contract uh, was started in June fifteenth, and I am still not in Australia because of this whole global pandemic thing. We're still trying to get me there, and the academic year starts in March. I am a senior lecturer in the School of Animal and Veterinary Sciences um, at the University of Adelaide, um, but I still have not technically started yet, so that's the sidebar there. Otherwise, I'm sure uh, another sidebar here is that Emily, Stephanie, and I have a long history uh, of chatting. Sarcasm. And, um, yes, <laughs> a bit. Um, <laughs> So, you know, there, there might be a few uh, side puns here and there or, or whatnot, but I'll do otherwise... my best not to. <laughs> I, I cannot guarantee that this will be a snark free conversation. So if you're offended by snark, you have been warned. And, and then, you know, Stephanie has a giant emu in the background <laughs> that looks like it's about to Jurassic Park peck her head. Uh, like Just, creepy uh, over the shoulder, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's it's and it's a it's an emu from New Zealand too, so it's uh, oh extra special. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. It's holding its head like it's inquisitive. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for wondering how tasty you are. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As it grunts. Um, <laughs> So I don't know where you two want to start off, or I had mentioned an idea, or we can open it up to questions, or this is really, I mean, we've got a couple hours here to chat about Excellent. birds and all things birds, burbs. Burbs, uh, burbs. if you want to be extra profesh. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I feel like I kind of need something to get me started because I am um an old lady and it's <laughs> 9 p.m here and i am doing my best to stay alert <laughs> but if someone gets me going i promise i can talk for more than a couple of hours so yeah excellent excellent <laughs> so i had an idea where to start but i want to allow anybody to throw out a question type out a question give them a second um if they do have a question otherwise we can kind of start at the top of the the three uh uh talking points that i uh that were listed on our little flyer mm -hmm. uh, so which was the idea of common versus typical behaviors mm -hmm. which i think the term typical in this context may not uh be as obvious um even if uh, it's it's my preferred technical term, but by typical, um, uh, it's it's a, a shorthand for saying species typical, um, and that's very relevant for welfare. Um, so knowing the natural history of any species or animal is important for why they do the things that they do. So when we talk about common versus typical. Um, 
and I, I'm just throwing, providing some context here, and then I obviously want to hear what you all have to say about this. Um, but when we talk about common versus typical, it's to say that one does not mean the other, of course, necessarily, right? So just because some behavior occurs frequently across a bunch of different animals may not mean it's part of their natural history and vice versa, right? So behaviors that would normally occur for that animal may not occur in some setting or for a bunch of animals under some context. So sure. that's all. Yeah. Two things like biting and flying comes to mind instantly. <laughs> right. I think that's where we started this conversation when we were talking about what we wanted to talk about is how people say all the time that like it's it's a parrot. Of course it's gonna bite. And every time somebody says that I kind of go you know they're up I'm just seeing the dog, right dog gifts with the head turned. I had to like they're like think about the fact that they've got wings if ever there was a flight animal I mean this is it like they're they're not, they're not designed to go around biting everybody like so is it that they're parrots and therefore of course they're gonna bite or is it that we are commonly culturally like doing stuff to them that's putting them in a position where they feel like they have to defend themselves all the time like yeah that that should be the thing that we think about when we make comments like that about burbs yeah know. and I'm by sure. parrot you mean cockatoos uh, <laughs> <laughs> only cockatoos yeah. only cockatoos. Just cockatoos yeah not the other 350 something species aside from the cockatoo species only cockatoos Yes. For sure. Yeah. No other parrots have and ever biting. anybody ever. And biting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think this is a thing like this, this pet peeve for me goes all the way back to like when I was 11 years old and I started volunteering in shelters and vet clinics and like <clears throat> the things that people say is like normal in animals isn't actually normal. It's just common because of what we commonly do to them. Like the diseases that cats get aren't normal for cats. They're common because we commonly feed them uh, species and appropriate diets, right? So oh, yeah. it started for me in the vet world, just seeing over and over again, people not recognizing that their animal is either physically, behaviorally or emotionally unhealthy not because that's normal for the species, but because that we commonly do that to them. Yeah, right? I mean, we see that with so many things, like especially right. it's super, uh, or like even more obvious in, in the vet, uh, vet care business, I would say too, because sure. like obese dogs is an example, like people are so used to seeing mm -hmm. chonky yeah. dogs that right. like when they see um, a dog that's actually like healthy looking, they're like, oh my God, the poor skinny it's dog. Skinny, you're under oh, yeah. You're <laughs> So it was either 2006 or 2007 because I was working at a clinic that I worked at over during those two years that a study came out and I don't remember the exact statistics. So take this with a huge grain of salt, but it was like 70 something percent of veterinarians and veterinary staff were unable to accurately identify where an animal fell on the BCS scale. Yep. On the BC yep. BCS scale is redundant. <laughs> <laughs> on the body condition scale yeah and and so it's like the people in the profession can't identify what is a healthy body then how are we expecting pet owners to do that right and this is supposed to be a bird talk so I didn't mean to yeah. kind of derail Sorry. it into dog and cat land no 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 I was the one who did it I started but my point is like the reason it's hard for me to like contain the snark is because this has been something I've been dealing with my entire life, starting in the veterinary field. And then when I became a parrot behavior consultant first and started working with birds, seeing that there too, it was just like, like this, like make it, my, my face is like involuntarily spasming every time somebody says something like it's parrots, they bite, what do you expect, yeah. right? Oh, it's the same for me. And like, j just to take a parrot related example of the same thing, like something I hear so often uh, when I'm out talking to, to bird clubs and stuff, uh, or just speaking to, to breeders is that, well, I mean, it's birds, you're gonna lose some. 
they die. <laughs> yeah, just birds happen. just die. Yeah. Like, they just fall out of the sky. It's totally normal. What? Yeah. I mean, it's normal that, that birds die sometimes. That's just, I, yeah. I mean, everything dies. But, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. but like, when an other, otherwise healthy, uh, like, when, when adult birds just die, Mm -hmm. or when they should die like out of all yeah age, probably right. something's wrong right that's when they're common. yeah not normal. <laughs> right well that's yeah. a really important point though because and i don't mean to make light of it um we're gonna do this i'm sure constantly where we're making these jokes so i don't mean to make light of it but it is um you'll see this and emily you you brought up an important point of using the term uh normal in this sense too um so you talked about common versus normal which normal is um i'm just using the word typical in this sense because i want to tie that into the natural history sure uh, but uh um so we could call you know yeah so um but uh this point of you know this is it's just common to lose this amount of of animals and you right. see that i think it's it's far too common um another really important point you made was the fact that we're not just talking about behavior at this level i am really my expertise is only going to be in behavior so i am going to limit anything i say beyond that um but uh that said we can talk about uh physiological uh you know common versus typical um, so weight is one of those issues. Uh, mortality is clearly another. Um, and so those are, those are problems. And, and to say, you know, well, you know, birds are just going to die is no, well, what you mean is it's common, but right. you know, is it, is it normal? Is it typical for birds to just die at that rate? Right. And that's an empirical question. Yeah. So uh, what do we know about their mortality uh, for that species in the wild compared to uh, in captivity? So those are all, I just got really serious there for a second. No, no, uh, that's good. Yeah. But, but yeah, like I, this is something I've been thinking a lot about lately, like how, how we tend to define good care or like good animal yeah. care or good husbandry as well. Because I feel like it, it sort of has the same problem that when, when, people tend to talk about, you know, reinforcement or enrichment as, as defined as something that people do rather than right. a process that has <laughs> a result. So like people tend to define good care in terms of what they, they do rather than the like actual impact it has on an animal. So like I'm doing all of these things that people tell me that I should be doing. So therefore I'm taking good care of my animal, but it's still right. sick and have these problems and doing this and that. Right. Um, which I, yeah, <laughs> I think, I think, yeah, I because, think yeah. What, as a species, we tend to, or maybe I shouldn't even make that claim as the, the cultures that we live in tend to conflate intention with efficacy or intention with ethics, right? Like the, and I, I like, I'm not going to take this in a kind of, you know, civil rights direction, but like the idea is, I can't be doing harm because I mean well and I and I feel love and I have good thoughts and good intentions. And so I can't possibly be causing harm, right? Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll just let you guys think about how that relates to societal stuff on your own because that's not what we're here to talk about, but that definitely applies to animal welfare and enrichment and good care, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. And I, I feel like that's, <clears throat> it's such a tricky thing, thing to deal with uh, in, in vet care too like I've, I've been in, in that field way shorter way less than you have um, but like since it's 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 my my last job <laughs> so it's sort of where, where my head is at nowadays um, but yeah it's especially when you work with with exotics like um, pet animals that are not dogs and cats it's like I've read some reports I don't really know if there's any any data actual data to back it up but like up to 90% of cases that we see are like could have been prevented if the animal just had gotten better care, which like from yeah. my point of view, um, like or from my experience rather, <clears throat> this does, does seem like it could be correct for sure. Uh, for sure. And most of people that have these animals, obviously they don't wanna, they don't wanna take bad care of them. <laughs> they wanna do right. the best they can and, right. and have all the best intentions. So, but yeah, right. it, it's, it's tricky when people 
really think that they're doing good and want to do good. Um, right. But yeah, sort of aren't. <laughs> right. So the question becomes, <clears throat> how do you, how, how do you, how are we defining good adequate care? How are we defining enrichment? What are our, what are our goals? What are, how do we, you know, actually measure our, our success against what, like against what standards, right? Yep. Um, because a lot of times it's a matter of identification. Like a lot of times when there's a training disagreement with somebody who comes from a different ideology, when you actually sit and have a conversation um, that it's, they don't know, they don't recognize that their ideologies are different because they don't recognize the difference in body language or response or, you know, behavior, right? So a, a lot of times that that's the crux of the issue is that we're, we're measuring what we're seeing against different standards. For sure. Right? Yeah. I think that's a, that's a super good point. Just, yeah. Or, or um, even, or even that if we're measuring them at all, because that's like often not the case, as, at least not explicitly, which it kind of should be. Um, right. I, I wanted to bring this back because it's relevant to something that Andy uh, brought up, and I, Andy and I were just chatting there uh, publicly. I haven't seen him in, gosh, I don't know. It's been close to a decade, maybe over a decade, but it's been a while. Um, so hi, Andy. Um, but uh, uh, so this idea and one of those metrics, and then this goes into another point that I want to bring up that EK uh, had messaged me um, to uh, talk about. Um, but, uh, you know, we can talk about different metrics for mortality, which are often used to make comparisons about how well animals are doing in captivity. So as mm -hmm. Andy mentioned, for, for some species or many species, you know, acute death may be, could be one of those metrics and they, and depending on, on what the data tells us, that may be, uh, and, and probably is for many, many captive species, um, uh, less likely. Um, I mean, you know, we have control over environments, right? Yeah. So um, things like uh, uh, extreme changes in temperature are less likely to cause acute death. Um, this is one of those- Predation. Yeah, predation. Right. We we would hope that predation occurs less often in captivity. Um, it's this is one of those reasons why I'm sometimes uh, skeptical. Uh, uh, if this is the only measure of the welfare of some animal, though, um, mm -hmm. in captivity, is if all we're saying is um, they're living uh, longer than they do compared to their wild counterparts, or they're dying from acute death less often it still begs the question of, well, as, as Malore would talk about. Um, so Malore has written quite a bit on, on uh, extending the five freedoms of welfare to the five domains. And as he's, as one of his uh, components to measure that is a, a life worth living. So yeah. even if we're talking yeah. about extending the lives of the animal, is it a life worth living? What other positive metrics? So this is to say, all of this is to say that obviously uh, mortality is an important metric, but should be combined with other things. We cannot use that alone um, as a good measure of welfare. But Definitely. that's- Well, and I, I think- have... Oh, sorry, go ahead. So I think also the, the notion of acute death needs to be sort of like sussed out a little bit, right? Because a lot of times, like I, I would argue, again, selection bias being, I'm only seeing the animals that are coming into the vet clinics that I've worked at, right? But like, or, which isn't actually true because I've also worked in an aviary and I was a pet sitter and I'm a behavior consultant. So I see birds in quite a few capacities, but, um, what we're seeing in captivity is more metabolic death, which yeah. if you don't know what you're looking for can look acute, right? If yeah. you don't know what a disease looks like in an eclectus parrot and then the eclectus parrot just keels over one day, you're like, oh, well, that was an acute death, but like, that's not true, right? And I, I think 
I, I have yet to meet anybody who would argue that metabolic death happens as much in the wild as it's happening. Yeah. I mean, metabolic disease is happening as much in the wild as it's happening in captivity. Yeah, so I mean, how um, common isn't it with like parrots that die of arthrosclerosis or something like that? It's right. a, it's, it can be a very acute death, like right. literally, but it's, it's not because of an acute, like it's a very chronic problem. So like one one example that instantly comes to mind uh, when you were talking about how like the length of life and, and quality of life are different things are like all the tortoises you get to see when you work at an exotic clinic. They are very hardy to their detriment because they just won't die. Like mm -hmm. they can live for decades right. with like the worst welfare you can imagine. Like they can barely digest things they're like uh, um, yeah calcium deficient can't like, like their bodies are not working but they're still alive and like mm -hmm. sort of dragging themselves around on someone's floor so people are like yeah they're fine they're turtles right. they're supposed to be slow so okay <laughs> uh, you know they're reptiles they don't really have behavior no, so, right. no that's right right um so i mean they don't uh, have so feelings they good. have scales birds are yeah. reptiles too okay <laughs> I, I I love making that joke with reptile people when I'm like, well, they don't really have behaviors um, because, and in fact, one of my, one of uh, my uh, co-faculty members um, is he, he studied uh, 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 lizards. I can't even tell you what species in the wild uh, native to Australia. It's some, um, um, and he spent a lot of, and we make jokes like that all the dang time because of how it's like yeah it's you're not attending to the behaviors that are specific but i'm detracting from bird talk um by talking about now i'm talking about reptiles but the same but thing I, are reptiles. I think it was really unrealistic to expect the three of us to stick to like a one birds. Venus or just birds like come on like yeah, uh, birds, yeah. <laughs> right we, i I was going to throw out an actual, uh, just to end some of the, the conversation on uh, mortality and, and metrics for welfare, um, since I think this is relevant, and I was going to say a, a good analogy for how this has been used um, is with uh, marine mammals, specifically cetaceans in captivity, where there has been a lot of effort gone into uh, looking at how long animals, so their mortality in captivity versus the wild, and use, because it's such a contentious issue, because people have made claims, uh, people who are very much against uh, cetaceans in captivity in any form have claimed, uh, you know, without data, uh, that they're not, li you know, they're, ju they're just dying, they're dying, they're dying all the time, acute mm -hmm. death, um, their overall mortality. And so, of course, people have defended, well, this is, the, you know, when you look at the data, it turns out that generally they, um, it looks like for many cetaceans, they do have longer lives in captivity than they typically do in the wild. The limited amount of data that is there for that. But again, what is that? That, that tells us nothing about the quality of life. So it's good sure. data to have, right? correlated with other measures. And it's important, especially when you have so many people making claims that this animal or, or this species is not living as long. So you have to refute that with data. I think that is a, a, incredibly important. But if we're using that as somehow uh, in and of itself a good measure of welfare, that's problematic. So mm -hmm. that's For important. Sure. Um, I, think, I think a good like just to bring it back to birds or try to at least like uh, also it, it's a huge problem because like what what metric of that do you want to look at do you want to look at like average lifespan because if we're talking say say so small songbirds like less than 80 percent of us like every songbird that hatches lives to be over one year old like they don't survive their first year that's the whole right. reason why they have those big clutches and have so many babies because so many of them don't survive so like yeah the average lifespan of a small songbird in the wild is very low <laughs> but that like it doesn't really say anything um, yeah i i was gonna say i mean this is what this came up in with elephants and welfare because originally people had measured longevity in captivity 
Um, so uh, Club and Mason, um, going back to the early 2000s, were measuring longevity and people quickly pointed out to them that this is not a great metric for mortality, that it's actually life expectancy, which is calculated differently. So I'm, I don't, I'm not gonna get into the, the, the particulars there because you know we're talking about different formulations of mortality now. But that said, even how you calculate these things can produce very different results. So when you look at life expectancy versus longevity, that's relevant. And, and that's what Club and Mason then did and showed that still Asian elephants in particular in captivity have shorter life expectancies. But uh, since that time, especially in just the past few years, and again, now I'm, I'm talking about elephants, both Asian and African elephants, <laughs> Um, but since that time, there have been so many cross-institutional, multi-institutional studies done uh, with elephants that people like Kathy Carlsteed um, have led and been involved with, um, uh, Greco, Carlsteed, um, some of these people that have led this, this charge and, and really produced some great, uh, uh, I mean, a dozen, almost a dozen studies, I think, just in the past four four or five years that are multi-institutional that are all about what's happening for elephants in captivity. Um, and actually I have a paper under review um, mm -hmm. that involves, uh, uh, you know, three elephants, one African and two Asian elephants and some mm -hmm. of the specific activities, um, uh, public feedings for those elephants. But not, I, I was about to say, do I, I don't have any bird papers under review um, right now. Um, that's so disappointing. Uh, Why are you even here, okay. Eddie? Yeah, right. right. You I know. <laughs> uh, let me let me do this really quick. <laughs> um, so, um, but uh, yeah, no. Uh, I was going to say I do have bird bird papers published in the past year. So, <laughs> um, well then, that, so I that, guess you can say I have a, a chicken, dove, and pigeon paper published. Oh, in, that's in cool. Each money. How about that? I like it. I like it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Um, I, I'm going to throw this back to because EK had asked uh, uh, about uh, basics for achieving specific behaviors with birds. And their example was uh, what a bird should exhibit before we ask a behavior to them and discuss me methods for asking for those behaviors. So um, I don't know much beyond EK if you want to elaborate on that. I mean, it sounds like you're talking about what what's your baseline activity before maybe you, you know, think about what you are looking to train a bird to do or what might you be interested in training the bird to do. And this kind of, I mean, this is indirectly related to the topic of common versus typical behaviors as well. So what might we expect birds to do? Um, you might want to elaborate on that, maybe, EK? And also yeah. Otherwise, you are, either of you are more than, um, oh, no, that's that's all right. Uh, so, EK, you want to switch it to also public, um, so to everyone, when if, if you type, if you want it to go to everyone, and nobody has audio other than Emily, Stephanie, and I, you can type in any particular questions you might have, but you can also make an address to everyone, or just to me, if that's easier for you. Um, yeah. So. Otherwise, you. It's you're... in general. It's it's really good for me if people oh. type stuff in the chat so I can see it because my working memory sucks. So I'll start thinking about something and then I forget what the question was if I can't read it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like seeing things in text. It's. Uh, I mean, uh, that's absolute that's basics it. for training a bird. Yeah. Okay. So. Wow. I mean. Oh, it's such a big question. Yeah, it's, I mean, the absolute basics is, is, is pretty much, I mean, harder, harder to answer than I think a specific question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, go ahead. No, I was just thinking one, what, uh, one part of the question was uh, what to look for before we ask for behaviors, like before we start a training session, I interpret it as something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think. I mean, to me, the absolute basics would be: um, is the is the bird comfortable around me? Mm 
right? Can we exist in a space in close proximity and the bird's like, yo, what's up? Instead of being like, be friend or foe, right? Um, uh, by the way, I don't do all the science talk. I what, do the which, wacky which, talk. What species is that though? What species of bird is that? That's like, yo, what's up? Um, every Mine species do. of bird. Do you That's not crazy. speak verb? I, I don't know. I just want to know. I want to know which, I want to hang out with that species of bird. That's just all well, like bird. All the burbs. Okay. You just, all the burbs. You, clearly, you clearly just don't speak burb, nope. which is fine. Whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, they all do it just in their own dialects. Thank you, Brittany. Um, so that would be the first thing. And then the second thing is like, what, what motivates the bird? What does the bird care about? What will they work for? Um, what what makes them super stoked as opposed to just kind of like okay with something um so i think that's the the, the absolute basic for me is like is the bird comfortable around me and do i know what they care about yeah i also think that one thing um just on on the lines of what what kind of to look for before starting a training session or before yeah during training sessions too uh is sort of I don't want to use that these terms too loosely, but like the level of arousal, because um, I feel like one one common problem that people have with birds is that they they get way too like way too into training, too excited, and that has a tendency to sort of set the stage for some undesirable behavior like nipping and and, and other things. So I tend to focus a lot on that, not like yeah, uh, exacerbating signs of that um, before and during I, I train birds yeah. in general. Uh, I, I, I think it's important with every animal, but I'm especially, uh, yeah, I look for it, especially when I'm working with parrots because um, mm -hmm. it's a common, common thing. I don't know if you agree. Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it's like, a, no the bridezilla effect, right? Or they just get so excited that they turn into these little monsters and, you know, nobody wants I, to be anymore. Yeah, I think it, I think it can have, a, like, there's a, a number of different sort of contingencies at play there. So one common issue is that people work birds that are way too hungry. Like, that's uh, <laughs> definitely something that's too common uh, nowadays. Um, and also, Like parrots are very, uh, very social, obviously. And especially if you have a bird that's comfortable with your, they're, they're often going to be very affected by like the way you move and talk. And people tend to get very excited when they interact with parrots because then parrots get excited and people think that's fun. So it sort of right. turns into this thing. And then, and then we have parrots that bite because they're parrots, <laughs> not because anything. Just, like that. <laughs> the parrots do. Yeah. yeah. That's um, just what parrots, they just bite. Yeah. Uh, they just bite. Um, um, there have been a lot these of- These are all parts of the jokes here that, that I was alluding to earlier. Um, but uh, uh, I was gonna say, uh, oh, by the way, I was gonna throw this out really quickly. I did lie. I do have a bird paper under review. Um, of course you yeah, do. You wanna take a guess though? I know that both of you can probably guess um, the general class. Um, <laughs> is it is it penguins by any chance? Could it it is. Oh it my is. god! I have a penguin paper under. Are you clairvoyant, so Emily? Um, so humble. I am. I am. Humble. I knew you would be able to guess that. Um, so, uh, but yeah. So I do have one bird paper under review right now. Um, so penguins. Penguins. They're mm -hmm. they're 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 the most adorable of all this. That's actually empirical. Um, so they're the most adorable of all, all the birds, every, every possible. I, I want to make some kind of bird, bad bird pun about emperor penguins now, but I won't say empirical <laughs> emperor penguins. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> I, I, we, we, can, we can talk about ox, but, um, <laughs> so. Let's not, let's not do that. Let's, let's not. Um, there were a few questions that came up. Yeah. Uh, so one of those, but I, I do want to throw, I, I, because I think that's important, this idea of assessing behavior and how do we assess behavior. And it, and it goes back to this normal 
um, you know, normal or typical versus common and what we're doing to, to determine, you know, what are our interactions? Like, how do we know whether this animal is or is not stressed um, mm -hmm. in some way? So uh, mm -hmm. how do we know what their welfare is like and how does that determine our future interactions with them? I think that's relevant. So I'll come back to that um, because like Stephanie, I have to have these things written down and see yep. them on. I <laughs> will that my brain does a million things uh, at different times. And this is part of, you know, uh, when Stephanie and I are talking, we have long lists of things that uh, are going on at the same time. Like five so. conversations at once. So yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or like when I dared to sleep for six hours and came back to 146 <laughs> missed messages, for instance. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> right, right. Was that just Stephanie and I going? Uh... No, I think that was a larger group of nerds. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah that, that was, was the a larger nerd group. I think I... you guys were just like 26 messages, which is reasonable for six hours. But right. I woke up and I was like, why is this happening? It's right. fine. So to answer your question, Andy, what if they're not comfortable with you? Yes, I mean, I think that's a, a really good question. And also uh, the answer is, you work, that should be your first priority, right? That, so the first priority is, um, help, you know, work to get the bird comfortable with you before you ask them to perform any behaviors at all, right? right. Um, so, so yeah, that's what I, what I meant when I said, is the bird comfortable and what are you motivated by? The first step is actually making sure those two things are true. Um, so yes, earn the bird's trust. Hey, is there a sciencey way to say that, Eddie? Earn the bird's trust? Are you so, going to for, for layman talking? There, there's a couple important questions there that we can ask yeah. um, that help produce some answers, um, I think. Operationalized trust. Yeah, well, that's one of, that's one component, right? Certainly. Mm -hmm. So we ask, what are the, what are the behaviors? that we are looking for, right? Sure, right. That is absolutely. And then we, we have to think about the species that we're working with as well. So mm -hmm. is this, and, and not, again, this is why this issue of common versus typical is so important because to say, I keep throwing the cockatoo joke in there because I, 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 I have a love-hate relationship with all cockatoos. I I'm think so they are amazing. <laughs> right. Is, is there any other way to engage with cockatoos than having no. a love-hate relationship? <laughs> no. Um, they're amazing. And, and you know what? I, I have found that a lot of uh, my anecdotal experiences, there are a lot of cockatoos out there that really hate me. Um, so... <laughs> Um, I think uh, if there's two, um, actually the most the, the most extreme example of any burb that has ever hated me, I think was a rhinoceros hornbill. Um, wow. So yeah, he, ooh, ooh, that, that bird did at Cincinnati. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it, I mean, it was, it was clear I was never going to have any form of direct contact free or, or even uh, you know some form of restricted contact, protected contact with this bird because that just wasn't happening. Um, as opposed to the bird that loved me the most, which was a Chilean widgeon at the same facility who courted Cute. me daily. Um, but um, uh, so all of that said, I mean, I think those these are important questions to ask: are what are the behaviors we're looking for? How do we how do we define those that so if we're saying the bird is comfortable um, mm -hmm. now okay what does that look like right. what are what are the things the birds doing what are they not doing and is that common or typical so uh, if we're just saying well the bird's not biting me it's like okay but that's <laughs> not maybe that that sounds like it's more um, now we're talking about uncommon rather than untypical right right. We, we need to maybe raise our standards just a little bit yeah, higher yeah. than the birds not biting me. And, right. and I, I'm, by the way, we're seeing all these, these questions we're coming, we're, we're yeah. going through, there's a lot that's, it's great. Um, 
So um, I was going to mention, and this is something I have no answer for this and no information. And I don't know if Stephanie or Emily have a response to this, but going back to what Renato had asked about um, saving birds in urban areas. And I, I have absolutely no response. Um, yeah. Like this is way yeah. outside of anything I know. Yeah, and when I worked in- so sorry, let, go, let ahead. Me, go ahead, for, Emily. For the sake of video, I'm just gonna read it because I just realized people aren't seeing these chats. So we wanna- Oh, so okay. Right. Renato had asked the question about, um, is it necessary to save birds in urban areas? So for example, young birds, fledges, or is it better to leave them alone? Yeah. And that's a really important question. It's a good question. Yeah. When I worked in wildlife rehab, we would get people all the time, like well-intentioned people bringing in these baby birds that had fallen from the nests. And it was super hard to look at them and be like, so you probably just killed this bird. <laughs> like, um, you know, like in, in most cases, if you find a baby bird somewhere, leave them alone because the parents know they're there and the parents are, you know, are going to take care of them and, and do things about them. I think the cases where that isn't so much true is like, if you witnessed, you know, I don't know, like a, a, a storm happens and a, an electric wire lands in a tree and sets the tree on fire and the parents die. And then there's this orphaned baby. Like if you know that the baby is orphaned, then, um, then, then you pick up the baby and, and take it to wildlife rehab. But um, for the most part, um, leave, leave baby birds where they are because the yeah. parents know they're there and they'll do something about it. Yep, and, and also like when it comes to birds in, in urban areas, many people wanna save them because there are cats around or, or things like that, which I can understand, but uh, again, I know this sounds kind of cynical, and it, and it's I, I mentioned this to I think to Eddie a couple of days ago that like ecology has made me more cynical than I want to be sometimes. <laughs> but it's but right. it's also like just a, just a fact that like the vast majority of baby birds, even not in in urban areas, they just do not survive past their first summer uh, because that's that's like their whole reproductive strategy is have. A lot of babies because a lot of them will not survive um, and and it's it sucks like nature sucks <laughs> for 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 a lot of animals sometimes right um, but I, I think so like and and i can i have just from the three years that i worked uh, at the vet clinic we often get um like orphans and and injured wildlife in because we have um, uh, like we work together with wildlife wildlife rehabbers um and at least two times we've had like an injured some kind of, of small bird come in, um, it's been treated and then it can be released. And then we release it. And then like literally a minute after it's released, it gets eaten by another bird. <laughs> it's like, yeah, okay. I spent yeah. four days caring for this oh. poor bird. And now yeah. it just died as soon as we released it. So right. yeah, that's, uh, that's, that sucks. Uh, that's <laughs> and not also, I mean, that is, that is, that is, uh, that is unfortunately, and you know, um, because, uh, so one of the, and again, throwing out, going out of birds, uh, you know, I, I talked about, uh, I, I, I published a paper that was part of a, a senior thesis uh, for an honors student um, that I supervised years ago, and we published it last year on ex situ conservation through enrichment um, and enrichment testing with gold nine tamarins. And when you look at the literature on golden eye and tamarins, yeah. um, so here's just an example of what's happening. I mean, there was a huge effort. So um, many, most accredited zoos, EAZA, so uh, AZA, EAZA being European uh, mm -hmm. Association of Zoos and Aquariums, AZA being the uh, American Zoos and Aquariums, um, or the Association for Zoos and Aquariums now. Um, so... Uh, and different WAZA, so the world version. Um, so they have, uh, you know, species survival plans, SSPs that they do. And so a big one that's been done for several decades now has been golden lion tamarins with uh, saving them, you know, doing this uh, reintroduction program. So breeding um, and reintroduction, propagation and reintroduction into places like Colombia. And it's been massive. Um, and people like Deborah Kleinman uh, led the charge on a lot of that. She did amazing work, uh, the late, the late Deborah Kleinman. 
um, did amazing uh, work studying this effect. But one of the things they found with golden lion tamarins was that they would uh, successfully, got, they got the government on board with having these animals reintroduced with uh, enabling programs to protect them. I mean, if you go down to Columbia now, I think even still now they have golden lion tamarins on their money. Um, so uh, it's pretty amazing how much there was just a public, a concerted public effort and government effort involved. And we, we got all this, you know, pairs of golden eye and tamarins, they we loosely here, but got them bred in, in captivity in different zoos across uh, North America and then started reintroducing them and then put them in the wild and they just started uh, disappearing because, mm -hmm. and it, turned out there was stuff done to measure some of what was happening and I always my comparison to this was it was like taking a homeschooled kid and placing them in the middle of New York okay. um, like that was it was like oh let me walk into the street and wave this cab down you know and plop you know, so <laughs> these gold mine tamarins were doing things like hanging down and foraging on low branches, and, you know, and they're they're doing almost like this Douglas Adams esque hitchhiker's guide where they're just like the, the sperm whale floating down, going, "Oh, what's that thing that I, I'm gonna <laughs> make you first?" And then like they're doing that to the snakes and other predators, like, "Oh, look, you're a pretty jaguar," you know, and boom. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there had to be some training of that and that's really relevant so but unfortunately that whole story was just to make that one little point um, of that these things are unfortunately part of what happens with uh, animals in the wild whether we're talking about reintroduction or not I don't um, my question and, and Stephanie you kind of you part answered this because I was going to ask about if you encounter things like brood parasites um, where you have stuff like brown-headed uh, uh, cowbirds that might, you know, the uh, 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 a invasive bird, uh, the brown-headed cow cowbird hatches in some other species' nest and kicks the babies out of the nest, um, you know, and I guess part of that answer is, yeah, you don't do anything, but then I don't know if there's a simple answer of, hey, do you, is there somebody you can call if you run into this rather than you grab them and take them to a zoo or a similar setting, a wildlife center um, out here, it would be pause. Is there some, is, is there a, a standard response for somebody who is concerned that you might engage in? I think that depends on where you live. Like if you live in Sweden, then absolutely there are a number of wildlife rehabbers that are the first people that you should be contacting. Um, and yeah, we, we have a number of organizations depending on where in the country you live and they will help you with that. And most of them, most wildlife rehabbers also have websites with like information where you can look up what to do when you find baby animal or, or anything else you might encounter um, in some, yeah. Some places you call uh, some kind of authorities, so it could be the police or it could be um, some other like governing uh, body. It depends uh, what what type of animal and like what what has happened. So like if there's if you've hit a deer with your car, you you call one type of person, and if you found a baby bird, that's that's another person's job. So, uh, but you can always contact a wildlife rehabber. That would be my like I don't know how, how the U.S. people or the other other than Sweden places people <laughs> would answer yeah. that what are words i can't even talk <laughs> what are words <laughs> what the are we words ask ourselves so many times what words uh, what words be what words be? Um, <laughs> i mean here well, in the states like it's pretty easy like you just you know pick up your phone and open your favorite web browser and go wildlife rehabber near me and then yeah. it like pops up a number and you call them and you're like here's what i found what do i do about it you know yeah. So um, I think that's like, I mean, people are posting links of different resources in yeah, chat. I think awesome. that's great. But also like, you don't have to memorize a website, just like Google it. <laughs> you know, like the, yeah. I promise you the internet knows who your local rehabber is. And if you call them, they can tell you what, what you should do about it. Right. Yeah. And in yeah. most cases, in most cases, don't do anything on your own before you talk to someone. Like, even if it seems like something super obvious, like I saw a video not very long ago with some guy uh, who tried to help a young rabbit that got stuck in like a, a skating ramp thing, like, a you know, those pits 
mm-hmm. when they skate. <laughs> I don't know what they're yeah. called in English. But yeah, uh, and he's, he just basically chased this little baby bunny until it was too tired to like resist. And oh, no. I can guarantee you that, that that bunny died like a few hours or days later because it had captured myopathy. So right. um, d- don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Ask for help. Yeah. Even if you like, or especially because you want to be kind, the best thing you can do is, is not do things on your own. Yeah. And so I think that's, that's a great, simple answer is look something up, look somebody up and don't do anything. Yeah. Uh, and this is detracted away from um, some of the behavior <laughs> conversation, but it's important, right? Yeah. I mean, this is important for, for many people to know about how what you do if you run into a situation like this. Apparently, if it's a vulture, and I guess, Andy, uh, any species of vulture. Um, oh, so, vultures you know, go to Andy. Right, uh, you, can, you can bring him. I don't know, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, Andy's only gonna run into what Turkey and uh, so the, the turkeys and the, and the, the black vultures. Um, in Colorado, I think, right? Um, do you have you have both, right? So I guess you're oh not going to get. You're not going to so, get. The... I'm so jealous of people that just have vultures outside in general. It's oh. does Sweden not have vultures? No. Who eats all your dead animals? <laughs> like all the other animals. <laughs> <laughs> Like, oh, no. like, if don't exist like who no. takes out your trash just like, cut it out. Felt, I, I'm like I've never felt as touristy as the first time like the first time I really got to go abroad for real was going to, to the US and to, to California and like I didn't even think about that there would be vultures there and I was, I was hanging out in San Diego and then I one day I just like looked up and saw a turkey vulture and I was just like holy fuck <laughs> yeah. like, oh my God. i'm just gonna have to put up with some swearing but like yeah it's yeah and then i saw like holy amazing things and, oh yeah i'm so I, so i have a i have a actually bird related similar anecdote um i used to work in music and um i was hosting this band from iceland and for like south by southwest one year when i lived in austin and they needed to go to a music store to replace some part of some instrument, I don't know. So we, I took them to this music store that's like in a like a, in a chain, like you know the store chain things. And um, so we were like walking from the car to the store, and all of a sudden, the entire band just goes ah! and like gasps and turns around. And I was like, "What's happening?" Like I'm looking around, like trying to figure out, and I'm like what was that sound? And I was like, what, what sound are you talking about? And I thought that sound. And I was like, I, can you give me more details? Cause I didn't hear anything. Right. And they're like, it was like a crackling. It was like, and then was it? A, one of the grackles started making his noise and they're like, oh my God, it's a bird. And they're like freaking out about the fact that this was a bird. So then we like get around the corner and like look and there's this whole little flock of grackles hanging out on the ground and they're all talking to each other. I love the way grackles sound, but like when you live in Texas your whole life, you just sort of like filter it out. You're not paying attention to it. And they're just like mystified by these birds that are making these incredible grackle noises. And, and like one, the cellist turns to me and she goes, in Iceland, we pride ourselves for all of our like natural beauty and nature but I have never been in a place where there are just birds in a parking lot that make these most incredible sounds. Like she was like, it was blowing her mind. And I thought it was like the most adorable thing I've ever seen in my life. But also every time I travel somewhere else, I do the same thing. Yeah. I'm like, I can't Absolutely. believe you have this amazing bird just hanging out on your like porch and you're fine with Ab- it. Like, right? I mean- Absolutely. That is, that is one of the, I was, uh, I was going to say, um, so by the way, I was just going to mention really quick. Um, there were so one of the first facilities that I worked with back in Texas um, was uh, uh, there was a turkey vulture who was one of who was like my BFF. Um, so I hung out with him all the time, Fred, um, and uh, he was amazing. And I would just let him chew on my leather jacket. Um, so uh, that's how we, I think we got to be BFFs. So he loved coming over. He'd see me and be like, 
start giving me some of that leather jacket. Um, yum, but, yum. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I was going to say one of the things, the, the day before, I mean, I, I started my interviews in Adelaide the next morning. I had been in Australia for five, six days, and I'm, I'm in this uh, this B and B, um, the night before, and I'm already just nervous. Like I've got interviews all the next day when I'm, this is a year ago, back when we used to be able to travel. Right. So when I was doing the interviews the before time in the long, long ago, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I have my interviews starting at, you know, I'm, I have to get up at like, you know, six, 7 AM the next day or something like that. And it's just past midnight. Um, and I'm at this B&B and I'm already just, you know, trying to think of all the ways to make myself go to sleep. And I'm in, I'm trying to fall asleep. And I hear outside my bedroom, I hear that, that sound, that very familiar sound. And I, I'm not even going to try to imitate it, but if, if do. <laughs> people know who know what I'm talking about, I hear it and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me right outside my window. Uh, of my bedroom in my B and B, and this is in South Australia, so up near. Uh, I'm in Gawler, um, so near our Rose Roseworthy campus, um, and uh, uh, I hear the sound of a kookaburra. He is oh right. God. He she is right outside my window, and oh I God. I probably spent the next hour trying to find the kookaburra outside so i didn't get much sleep that night um uh, yeah. but it was just amazing yeah. uh, right. so i'd never you know i i had seen this elicited in captivity i'd never heard it and i didn't get to see it unfortunately but it, it was amazing and and That's... yeah but i heard it and i heard it a lot uh -huh. and uh, and i was beyond excited to, so just to hear and if you haven't heard a kookaburra before i highly just just youtube it there's um, really good like dub yeah. dubstep remixes too yeah oh, nice. <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's perfect for the the kookaburra is just to, yeah. no it, it, it's one of the most in fact um so i would uh when i would be kayaking in indiana we had belted kingfishers um so and i had never until indiana i had never heard a kingfisher in general before which the kookaburra is just the largest of the kingfishers yeah. mm -hmm. and so uh i got to watch one foraging while kayaking one day and i was and uh and i you know i'd had experience i'd been around kookaburras at that point but i'd never heard a, another kingfisher species so i got to hear these i think they're belted kingfishers and they just sounded like um really uneducated kookaburras yep <laughs> um that was basically it it was like trying to be a kookaburra but instead of using okay. his words he was just like Meh! You know? so, <laughs> yep oh, the linebackers of the bird world <laughs> 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 yeah yeah so it was still amazing i mean i got to watch this as i'm kayaking you know i got to watch this belted kingfisher just going around and 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 uh dipping down um and making the sound as it would it, as it would go to you know get up on a branch or go to dive um and i just kept i was laughing and and uh, you know the other one or two people kayaking with me just thought i was the weirdest person on in the world and i'm like you have no idea how amazing it is to hear this in contrast to a kookaburra yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so oh that's yeah. so funny well lee beat me to it but i was going to mention that she she knows how i how i was when i was in australia just like mm -hmm. hearing laurie keats and being like <gasps> Yeah. Just going around looking at I, and like the thing is in Sweden we have something that's called allemansrätten so basically like you can go anywhere you want like it doesn't matter if someone owns that land like you can you can always walk wherever you want you don't have to worry about who's the property owner or anything like that which is not the case in like the US and in no. Australia. but it's kind of no, easy no. to get as a Swede <laughs> so I had a tendency to like wander into people's properties to like take pictures of, of uh, Australian magpies and be like, wow, cool birds. And yeah, people yeah. wrote me yeah, that. I probably shouldn't do that. I, 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 I was was gonna, <laughs> depending on where you are in the US, 
and yeah. depending on what you look like, and especially um, in parts of the U.S., if you have an "s" on the end of your last name, that is a really, really bad idea, just to start yeah. walking onto people's properties. Um, yeah. But oh, fun! Um, yeah. So, because I have done that in the U.S., um, and uh, uh, it, it some some there have been some events that have not turned out for uh, all that well. Um, wow. uh, but uh, I, you know. I, yeah. So yeah. that's nice to know that's the case in Sweden. I did not know that. I yeah, have so. some the, like the best. U Utah, while being the most kind of one of the most good old boy states, is also blew my mind coming from Texas where like every square inch of land is owned, except these like little state parks right. that are like, this is a state park, you guys, right? So right. like, then I went to Utah and like the first time when I came to Utah for like a two week working interview, more like on on the weekend driving down this road and there's this car pulled over and there's like a tent there and I was like what are these people doing and the people who are driving me around are like they're camping and I was like you can't camp at the side of the freaking road like what do you mean they're camping like that's against the law and they're like no it isn't it's public land and I was like wait what do you mean public land like talk to me about this like what I just didn't even understand the concept I was like you mean you can just pull over and like put up a tent anywhere and yeah are fine with it and they're like yeah as long as it's public land yeah and I was like well what's public land and they're like everything that isn't owned by a person like they, they just yeah. don't understand and it just, and it just blows like, my mind that that's not the case everywhere it's just <laughs> yeah like, I'm used to just being like yeah I want to go for a walk I'm just gonna walk wherever I want yeah that's not really so, an animal story but it is but I, it is I, kind of I, I was going to say, I mean, these are always, uh, these are great, um, like, it's good information in general for bird watching, and bird watching is an important part of talking about birds, um, so, uh, you know, that's always important, but we want to get back to some back to birds. training. Thank you, Eddie. Right. Oh, is, by the way, I may have uh, someone doing yard work outside my window, so I apologize Excellent. if you start hearing. Uh, it sounds like there's a leaf blower out there. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Andy, I, I know well how Eddie can keep us up all night talking. Yep, 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 most definitely. Um, but uh, there was a question asked, EK had asked a question earlier about, uh, so some of the potential uh, reinforcers, so re potential rewards for birds other than food and talking about some of that, what you can do with training. I don't know if what you all have to say, you all oh. being Emily and Stephanie. And, a uh, lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, Since, literally. No yeah, no, literally, like anything uh, I use, or like, there's, there's so many things, especially with parrots, like toys. I mean, what the last workshop I had before COVID, I started training uh, a mini macaw with like a clean syringe, just using it as a toy. Mm -hmm. And we trained a step up with that, like it stepped up and, and got to play with this syringe. Uh, so it can be objects like that, but also like, um, like social stuff yeah. <laughs> or the lack of better words like I have this whole ritual with Echo one of my my greys where, where we do we have this like almost ritualized uh, movements that we do like every day and like I've never intentionally reinforced that with any kind of tangible or food or anything it's just like it's a social thing like that's how right. how most people uh, most people most uh, species of parrots uh, learn to talk too like their vocal learning is very just based on on social cues and social reinforcement and stuff so uh, so yeah the possibly unhelpful answer is pretty much anything and it depends <laughs> yeah well i mean i don't i think yeah, it depends, right? Is the kind of like magic catch-all answer for everything. Yeah, but it's but I mean, I think it really does. It, it's about knowing the individual bird and the context in which the behavior is occurring, right? So like when I worked at a sanctuary, which shall not be named, um, <laughs> but when I worked at the sanctuary, they had a, a cockatoo flight with Moluccans. And there's this one Moluccan when every time we would go into the flight to clean because the hose would like not let the door close all the way. This, this particular Moroccan would always get out of the door 
and go into the airlock and go up to this corner to like chew on the wood ceiling. So first of all, whose brilliant idea was it to have a wood ceiling in a cockatoo house, right? So like right there, that's just a, a, like a basic management fail. Like don't build a cockatoo house out of wood, you guys. Um, but secondly, like the, they just had no, this, this bird didn't want food, that they couldn't like get this bird down with anything. So the way after every time they, cleaned out this flight, the way that they would get the cockatoo to go back into the cage was by taking the water hose and like shooting water at the bird and kind of pushing him with the, with the flow of water, like pushing him back into the run. Right. And surprisingly, this bird was unpredictably aggressive. It's weird. Like I could never oh, right. figure out the connection there. Right. So strange. Um, so like just watching, first of all, we have a pretty good idea because he's a Moluccan cockatoo that uh, he he's going to be motivated by melodrama, right? I think that's just a reasonable thing to say that melodrama is reinforcing for cockatoo, for Moluccans. Um, and you would watch this bird every time like people would come out and get frustrated with him and be like, why do you do this every time? And like, he's up there in the corner being like, ah, this is amazing. Like, this is gonna be fun. And like running from the, the water, like obviously he hated being hit with the water but but like the whole interaction that whole dynamic was obviously reinforcing the behavior like just watching his butt and but just by the fact that the behavior kept occurring right but um but like just watching his response to people so I was like how about we just not spray him with a water hose and instead we just like throw a big stupid party and act like an idiot and so that's what I did. I like came out with these toys that I see him playing with all the time. And I'm like, blah, 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 like acting like a complete friggin' moron and like hitting the toys on the, on the, on the side of the cage and be like, this is amazing. Like, look at the party you're missing, bird. Cool. And like, he just was like, what are you doing down there? Why can't I be a part of this? And so like, he just came down and he was like, what's going on? And I was like, I'm like having a super fun time with these toys, Burb. And, and he just like wanted to be a part of it. And I gave him a toy. And then we like got to hit the toy on the, on this wall together. Like he got to slam his toy on the wall and I got to slam my toy. I was like, we should do this inside the run, you know? And he's like, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And, and they say like, bird people are strange. Like, I don't I know. know why they say that because we're like perfectly sane and normal <laughs> grounded mature adults. Um, but like, we just sort of like, <laughs> we're totally uh, normal, right? Um, and so we just sort of like took the party into the run and it was fine. Totally and then like, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're not normal, we're typical. I'm sorry, Eddie. <laughs> you had to. You had, there's, there's, that was the only direction that joke could go in, right? Um, uh, yeah, it was just like, it was not a big up. deal. It just wasn't a big deal. Like every, every day that was how I got him back into the run. And surprisingly, he liked me. I don't know why. Oh, yeah, why would right? he do that? <laughs> it's a magical there's, connection that we can't explain. There's really two important parts there too. Uh, that you're, I mean, there's more than just two, but there's two things that I'm, I'm, I wanted to point out that you talked about there, which are really relevant. Which is access to tangibles. So that's something that we can talk about now as potential reward that is non-food based and making that access, and that includes interaction. Right. Um, so access to interactions access i mean we can we can take that and contrive that in a way so we can deliver it as a reward as a potential reinforcer for some response and the other really important component of that is behavior is predictable right so this is part of and it's a really important part because i think you know when we talk about the philosophy of behaviorism of behavior not behavioralism um, <laughs> the philosophy of behaviorism oh of behavior analysis and part of that it is that behavior is is predictable right that we can actually i mean th there's a reason why people like skinner wrote books called science and human behavior because that was a a crux of the argument was that hey behavior is predictable it is observable we can uh, we, we can examine this empirically like any other subject matter. And I, I think that's a really important um, 
a, you know, philosophical viewpoint to take when dealing with any aspect of behavior rather than just saying, I don't know, it just happens. They just wanted to do it. They just, they, that's what they wanted to do. So they did it. Well, these things don't happen out of, out of nowhere. It's an environment behavior interaction. There's a, there's contingencies involved. There are consequences involved. And you're talking about now making access to tangibles, access to interactions with you and making that. So it's, it's, it consequates some response. And right. that's, a, that's equally as important as the item itself, right? right? So how you make the access to that, that thing. And it takes, I think, a lot of creativity um, and a lot of knowing the animal. Um, yeah, I, I that, have one. I actually have a video example, if I can, if I can yeah. speak there. just some yeah some fun this is a super old video but it's also with echo one of my uh, one of my grays my timle and uh, let's see you should see you should be seeing the screen now yes yes okay. oh, this, so, is, this is one of the grays <laughs> yeah this is echo my little man he's a he's a total weirdo and i love him uh, but, but this is just an just an example of like something you wouldn't think of when you think oh, what's a good reinforcer or a potential reinforcer uh, to use with a parrot? This is something that just like sort of developed on its own, which is, I think, something that happens with a lot of animals, but parrots especially, at least if you ask right. me. So, so what happened here was this sort of developed over time, but I think it started as him sort of just leaning a bit on my hand at one point. Uh, and I wasn't really prepared. So I sort of moved my hand to try to counter it because it felt like I was sort of dropping the bird which obviously I wasn't but yeah uh, and he obviously figured out that huh if I do that then she moves her hand and then it sort of developed into this very elaborate swinging game which looked like uh, this I think I need to reshare so you can hear the sound though one moment I agree Andy <clears throat> there we go whoops am I really so like, I'll just, you can see like in the start here that he, he's actually like flipping off my hand and then I move my hand. He's like leaning. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a super old video, so just ignore the text. But like, yeah. <laughs> And uh, so the, the, the context I often show this video in is that this is a super effective reinforcer for that specific behavior in that context, but that doesn't mean that I could just start swinging him around when he does something I like. Like he would literally freak out and hate that and probably bite me very hard <laughs> if I tried to do that. So that's very context specific and something that sort of developed uh, for that specific behavior. So yeah, just, uh, yeah. I think that's a really important point that reinforcers are contextual, right? Yes, I mean, absolutely. And that's one, that's one thing that I think is hard. It's a more difficult conversation to have with clients because they're like, well, what can I use to reinforce my bird? And I'm like, I, I don't know. It depends. it depends on the circumstance. Like, I don't know. Like, you tell me, like, what in, in this moment, like, do you, you know, or when people say like, well, my, my bird's favorite reinforcer is a pine nut I'm like well that's probably usually true but like is that always going to be true like if, if your idea is I reinforce with pine nuts then you're less likely to be paying attention to what that bird actually wants to work work for in that in, in that specific interaction right yeah. and that also goes for preventing behaviors <clears throat> that we might not want to reinforce <laughs> like right. one right. example that I often bring up too is um uh, so both of my greys are, are very good at finding out what sort of makes me pay attention to them, obviously, because mm -hmm. they're, they're parrots. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but so I had, I was working, this was also several years ago when the, when their aviary was in, um, in the, the living room where I lived at the time, but I was sitting there working and then I just heard, like I heard something and I reacted to that. And what happened was that uh, Eris, uh, my, my other gray, she had sort of pulled on um, the, 
their feeding dish. So just like pulled it out from the holder a bit and it made a sound. And I just stopped what I was doing and just looked in that direction. And I could just see in that in that moment how like the <laughs> turning and she's like, ah. <laughs> and then that was a thing for the next couple of weeks. She just right, really did anything she could with that bowl to yeah. as soon as I was in the room to get my attention. Um, right. So so yeah, things like that. Um, yeah, are very yeah. important for for understanding and sort of figuring out not just what the behaviors we want to encourage, how we can reinforce those, but also yeah. how we can avoid <laughs> reinforcing the ones yeah. that might not be very, very healthy or pleasant. Yeah. yeah. Stephanie yeah. knows that when we moved into our current house, Kaya had really bad diarrhea. She knows because she was here like two days <laughs> after we moved into the house. I was like, since you're here, will you help me build my bird room? And oh my I, the reason I know she's friends with, we're like that she's an actual friend is because she helps me put together my Grey's monstrous cage and she doesn't hate me. Like we're still friends. So that's how you like, know. I have, I have completely forgotten about this. <laughs> <laughs> horrible, horrible cage that I got rid of. And it's just the worst cage in the world to assemble. And she did great. Um, and we're still friends, so it's fine. But anyway, so Kai had stress diarrhea and I was really concerned about her. And so like every time Kai would make this specific weird noise, I would go into the bird room to just make sure she like wasn't dying or something. And of course, Birdosaurus, my gray picked up on that. And so, uh, yeah, for years afterwards, he would just like make that sound sometimes. And, and not like in a... He made that sound during very specific times of day when I normally come in and do things in the bird room. And it was his way of being like, I'm hungry and it's like time for her to come in and feed us. So maybe if I sound like I'm dying, she'll come in and, and finally feed us, right? So it wasn't just like a noise that he was just chattering throughout the day. It was in these very specific contexts, very intentional. Like this is the sound that will get her to come running into the room. So yeah, for sure, like that, that stuff happens. Yep. I think I that's like something are extra good at that right yeah oh for sure like they are so good at um just observing and and like yeah what what happens yeah. in this context and and what does that result in and then like yeah it's it's super cool with their vo vocal learning I think um for sure yeah <laughs> like that's that's I mean my, my guy started to sound like the microwave pretty quickly because every time it beeps I run to the microwave and they were like huh neat I'll, I am a microwave come 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 run right run here <laughs> run to me because I make microwave <laughs> yeah I mean can we talk about that for a little bit because I feel like th like birds use sounds differently yes. like individual bird what I'm trying to say is individual birds use sounds for different reasons. So what I mean by that is like, if we're looking at uh, Kaya and Bayou, who are my two eclectus, Bayou is a red-sided hybrid, probably rub, I don't know, hybrid red-sided something. And um, Chahaya or Kaya is an Aru, but like similar, like they're both eclectus, okay? Kaya talks for the joy of talking right she's throughout the day she just like says things and she's just sort of like imitating herself Bayou only speaks to communicate and so I have no idea what how big his vocabulary is because he's said things once and never again and and so like I, I want to talk about that I want to I want to talk about that because like this fascinates me that like this is there's even within the same species I have these individual birds who are using like human language for very different purposes right sure um, I think I think it's super cool and vocal learning in parrots is something that is super interesting because I mean first of all we, we of course we have like individual differences but there's also huge differences in between species uh, right, yeah. and the context in which different species of parrots uh, vocalize or, or imitate so something that most most parrot species have in common is that they have very few like um, species typical or innate sounds they have a, one or two alarm calls the begging calls they make when their babies uh, are more or less innate but the rest is, is learned in most species. And if we look at like parakeets, um, they have a very specific context for that. And like, there's, there's good reason why only the males will mimic sounds. And that's because they use 
their mimicry as like it's part of their uh, reproduction or like right. their, their courting behavior. Whereas in African greys, that's just not the case. It, it doesn't really have a lot or at least not only to do with that. It's more of a, yeah, it's a way more complex social so, social thing in them. Um, right. So like we have all those species differences. And then, like you said, like differences between individuals, uh, not just the they they, but like the context that they say things in and stuff like that. And also in the same like individual. So my mm-hmm. guys can have one sound that in one co- context has a very like clear uh, consequence and in another context means something totally different. So like they can sit and just practice or it can be to make me do something or it can be something different. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's super cool. <laughs> and yeah. the, there's there's a, an important component here too, which is when we talk about the function of some behavior, um, it's, it's also important to realize that we may not know what the function of that behavior is. And it's, it's right. always, you know, we are cause effect yeah. organisms. For That's sure. what we are. Right. We are cause right. effect. I mean, this is part of all this talking stuff we do is, you know, this, this language thing we have really facilitates our ability to learn things about our environment. Um, Mm -hmm. as as far as I and many other behaviors see it. It allows us to learn things about our environment that we don't have, you know, we don't have to put our hand on the stove to learn that touching stoves is bad, right? Right. And it leads to a lot of weird beliefs. That's why, you know, I'm like, everybody believes weird things. So we have to be careful about, you know, what we, we think about our own opinions. This is part of why, you know, any any former or, or current student of mine knows they will hear me see say con- often enough I'll say don't believe your own bullshit yeah. right, right so that's a very common thing good advice. I yeah. don't believe your <laughs> own we're bullshit. all kind of full of bullshit yeah we all, we all we all have opinions we all have and oh, that yeah. that is it that is really relevant to determining because we all do this cause effect thing and we all go, well, and we do it in weird ways. I mean, you know, we have superstitions. We had like, I got a home run and I was wearing pink socks that day. So now I have to wear pink socks whenever I go up that. And we do weird cause effect things. And, and those things are very much language particular. So we do these things. And, um, and that is this, this idea that, you know, like, well, you know, I don't, I may not know what the function of this behavior is, but Mm -hmm. I am still going to imply what the, the, you know, I'm going to make some assessment. And that's, that's, you know, it's part of why we do things like descriptive analyses, or we can do more formal functional assessments. Emily already knows where I'm going with that, which Mm -hmm. is, by the way, there's the leaf blower near my window. um, But I don't know how loud that is. So I apologize again. But um, so a descriptive analysis would be an accurate way to say we're doing uh, an informal uh, assessment of the ABCs, right? Or, or even a formal but non-database assessment. This is what right. the, the, this is what behavior analysis refers to this as is a descriptive analysis or assessment. And a functional assessment would be now I'm going to incorporate data to identify function. Right. at some level. And we could get into a very specific type, like an Awadian functional analysis, but regardless, that's what functional assessment is. So I take a little, I have a little, I take a little umbrage when I hear people say, I'm doing a functional assessment. Okay, where's your data? I don't have any data. Okay, you're not right. doing a functional assessment then, right? But nonetheless, you are doing- I'm changing it in the mentorship program. It's going right, to be- right, right. You are <laughs> examining the function through a descriptive analysis. Right. And that's important because that allows us, even if it's through anecdote, to identify the function of some behavior. Um, Mm -hmm. Andy had mentioned about talking about behaviors as consequences as well for other behaviors. And that alludes to the PREMAC principle, which has been, you know, um, the PREMAC principle itself is a little tough to throw because unfortunately, I think it's been, uh, it's the, the generalizability of the PREMAC principle is not, it is not everything and all things. 
Um, so right. I know that tends to be a little pervasive at times in the training community. Also, um, if you go back to things like Allison and Timberlake and you look at the response deprivation hypothesis, it turns out, as you were emphasizing, Emily, it's less about behavior and more about the context of the behavior. So I can, in fact, get behaviors to occur more or less often depending on how much I produce that behavior beyond its baseline level of activity. Right. And that right. is really, that's really, really important. So it's not, it just, it does, it turns out it's not as simple as this behavior is more likely to occur than that behavior. And therefore this one's going to reward that behavior. Doesn't right. actually work out quite that simply, um, right. but it's still relevant. So, yeah. and, and beyond that, con context matters for things like, now we're going back to typical behavior. Um, I'm gonna, I'll give you a weird example here um, because this is really, this is relevant, but how it fits within what that, that animal, what that species, what that or organism would typically do is mm -hmm. relevant. So there's part of what I've talked about, which is the, and this is really important for, for when we talk about feeding animals in relation to behavior. Because it right. turns out we may be doing things that we don't know are producing food preference. I'm about to bang on my window here in a second. Like, hey, man, can you stop for a second there? <laughs> um, so um, we may be doing things that increase preference for food right. oh or God. aversion to food without knowing that's what we're doing. Um, and yeah. part of that is because there's a bivalent property to food preference and food aversion and and this is this goes beyond just operant effects so there's a bivalent property and it's well documented that it turns out if you take an activity so for things like rats it's wheel running rat, uh, rats and mice you, but you take mm -hmm. any activity you can do this with birds as well people have done this um, with pigeons as well Mm -hmm. depending on where food occurs in reference to that activity may increase preference for that uh, food or uh, make or decrease preference, what would be called taste aversion now. And I use this, by the way, with because I, I do a lot of I do a lot of hiking and I mm -hmm. use this this principle, this bivalent property with that as well, part of the many ways that I, I, I take data on probably too many things for myself. And, um, and it's, it's really relevant um, for food stuff because what I'll do is if I know I'm eating something that I wanna increase, and this is where this becomes relevant to birds, by the way, I wanna increase my desire to eat those things, then what I will do is eat those after I go on a hike. And if I eat some, if I, you know, turns out I'm having a weird day or whatever. And I eat, a, I eat, you know, it's like, I'm going to just eat a bowl of pasta followed by chocolate or whatever right. terrible thing. I'm like, well, time to go on a hike because I follow the activity after that. It, it, it is a very untypical thing and it will decrease preference for those items. This is right. well documented. You, this right. can happen with birds too. And I've, I've seen people um, try to figure out like what's going why does my bird always want this and want that and and we look at where the activity is occurring in reference to that now i'm not talking about other physiological properties and i do i should note that there are important medical concerns in part of this as well like i don't sure. want to get into any of that but it's really it, it, it gets at the predictable nature of behavior that becomes important and how we identify some of these things with birds so it turns right. out when you use so knowing that you know, most animals seek food and when they, when their activity is highest, right? So right. food following activity tends to increase preference for that food right. and activity following food tends to decrease. It can be really important to when you interact with your bird, yeah. right? Or any, any animal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had, you know, like one of my favorite stories um, and this may only be partially related to what you're saying, but I, but it, it occurs to me in this moment that like, um, I, one of the most like humbling experiences for me was trying to diet convert 
a budgie. Um, and I had at that, by the time I got this budgie, I had been, you know, working in, in veterinary capacity or in shelters with birds for, for two decades. And, and I was, re I, I still am really insistent that like diet conversion is always possible unless there's like some medical component, right? Like diet conversion is always possible. And I, that's like something I always say. And then I had this little budgie that for two months, I could not get this bird to eat anything other than bird seed. And I was like, this is like the most humbling moment for me because I've been like, for in two decades, I've never failed at, you know, diet converting an animal. And then here's this little friggin' budgie that like is breaking me. And I was talking to one of my like avian vet friends about it. And he just sort of like does his eyebrows like this at me. And he goes, budgies are colony parrots, put it on a mirror. He'll see his reflection or she'll see your reflection. And I was like, oh, right. And I just like put this little mirror down and put the chop on the mirror. And immediately, immediately this bird goes, other bird and like goes down and just starts like eating this fresh food and I had tried everything I knew how to do to diet convert this bird and nothing and then like all I do is sprinkle it on a friggin mirror and the bird's like this is amazing like why didn't you tell me about this chop thing before person and it was just like oh yeah because nutrition it doesn't exist in a vacuum eating doesn't exist in a vacuum right you have to look at the behavior of eating food in the context of species typical behaviors, right? In the context yeah. of this bird's ethology. And like, and it just was this moment for me where I was like, I had I had been focusing on all of these ways to like, you know, gradually get the food introduced. And it never occurred to me to look as eating at eating as a behavior in the context of species typical behaviors. Right. Right. And so that really was a shift for me. And now when I'm diet converting any animal, that's always something that is in the back of my mind is what, how does this animal, how has this animal been designed to eat? <laughs> right. Yeah. And let's look at that. So, yeah. Yeah. This yeah that's is a good point. My little anecdote related to what we were talking about. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's really, yeah, it's, that's really wonderful. It's really excellent for, for making that, that, similar point which and also getting at the importance of the individual in these assessments right. so it's not just that like it, behavior is predictable but also behaviors it's individualized so and it, it's it's the the organism matters for both the species and the individual so right. and if there's one thing i think the greatest contribution that uh behavior analysis has made to the field of animal behavior um, happens to be, and it, it goes beyond even saying assessments of reinforcer. Honestly, I think the greatest contribution for applied animal behavior is its focus on individual performance. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean empirically measuring what occurs for individuals and being able to predict based on the way that that is done. So knowing for any, I, there is no greater tool for assessing the behavior of an individual than within subject methodology. There is just no greater tool. And it's still, I think it's unfortunate that many academic journals are very um, opposed to the use of within subject measures. And then equally that they're not used enough by consultants behaviors you know this is i still haven't gotten to this point where where uh i'm trying to help non-academic people use data in some way that's relevant to their lives and their consultations because mm -hmm. that's an, it's an incredible tool but we right. you know it's important to know these things yeah so, yeah. yeah absolutely i totally agree with you on that yeah i mean and this stuff too is how we like shift people's thinking about like how do you get your pet whether it's a bird or any other species to take their medication right yeah. or how you know what I mean like how do you get them to be comfortable with um this idea of like this thing that may not be delicious to you now but I want you to learn how to just ingest this right yeah um so there's a lot of like 
I mean, not that anything that you're saying isn't practical, right? But I mean, like, there's so much. What, what? what I what I, what I meant to say, I started that sentence and I was like, that's not what I mean. What I meant to say I, is. I say are... a lot of non practical things, though. So <laughs> let's be clear about that. My, 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 my science is the answer for everything is not the most practical, but that's part of what I rely on, on people like, uh, and I, sorry, I'm interrupting your train of oh, thought, okay. but, um, uh, so I rely on, on people like both, you know, both you and, and Stephanie to help me find ways to make science, you know, or more specifically data empiricism more practical. Um, because I think that's so anyway I, I'm going to shut up because I, I just wanted to oh, interrupt no. by saying I'm not very practical in many ways I was I mean I just wanted to make sure I, you I wasn't I was not implying that you were being too esoteric or whatever my, my point was that like there are so many practical applications for this right there's so many ways that like knowing that this knowing knowing the the science knowing the research even on the extremely rudimentary level that I do, because I'm I'm not a scientist, right? Um, so like my, so knowing this stuff and learning learning these concepts is really important because when you get when you start learning this stuff, you can see how to like draw this down into this very specific real life problem that you have. Like how do I get my bird to take their medication, right? How do I get my bird to eat this healthier diet that the vet wants me, my bird to eat? Like yeah. that stuff, like when you know this, the, the research that exists and the, and the, the kind of principles underlying all this stuff, then you can kind of draw it down into the real world in these very specific ways that really matter to people, right? Yeah. Um, yep. That's the, and, that's the beauty of it. No. And, and when you just start thinking about behavior, as observable, predictable things, right? So these right. are variables that I can observe and predict and that are functional, that are contextual. Right. That is absolutely critical. So instead right. of just, you know, when I, I look at my, let's go to cockatoos now. Now, you know what? Let's not talk about cockatoos again. Let's talk okay. about, let's, let's, let's mention ox. Um, so I look at my <laughs> auk. I look. No, we're not going to say it in auk. I was going to. Uh, so we look at. We look at. Uh, what's a What's a good bird that I can use? E the emu. So no, yeah. that's a terrible. <laughs> thing. Um, so anyway, we look at a. I'm not even going to give a species, but we look at the bird in this situation, and we say, "Well, my bird is. You know, he's angry with me. He is. He is mm -hmm. upset. He's just. He's doing that to make me mad." He's mm -hmm. doing this, and and there 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 there's a there can be a kernel of truth in that, but it's mm -hmm. difficult to decipher if that is our level of interpretation. Is right. we're just you know so, okay, but I don't know how to resolve this. Like, how do we? Can we use our language in a way that makes this more likely for us to be able to both understand the function of that current behavior? and change its future occurrence. So, yeah. oh, oh, I was gonna have ravens. Um, we can talk about- I'm, I'm never not mad at talking about Corvids. <laughs> I'm never right. gonna say no to Corvids. <laughs> oh, we're, I'm not gonna forgive Stephanie for her last Corvid pun, um, <laughs> but- um, What, the murder mystery? <laughs> yes. <laughs> a good one, okay. That was that I'm was proud. That, that was foul. Oh no, that was worse. Um, that one was worse. That yeah, one was that definitely was worse. worse. That was my <laughs> pun. So, um, but yeah. So uh, and and all, all the corvids are, are great examples of. I have never worked directly with. I had to stop and think about that for a second. Nope, I've never worked with any corvid species directly. Um, I've never had a lot of interaction. Uh, oh, I with, love them. With captive corvids. Um, I love I them so much. They're special, <laughs> for yeah. sure. But I love, you know, like, uh, yeah, they're they're great. Mm -hmm. um, they're amazing. Um, so, so uh, but it becomes even that much, for something like corvids, it can become that much easier and that much more problematic to 
sit there and impute the intent of the animal and focus on that right. instead of the observable behavior. Right. Yep. Right. So, yes. and it For doesn't sure. aid us in identifying. I mean, this is the only, uh, I, language I treat as, as functional, right? I'm, the, the thing that I am most concerned about with any type of language is not just, it's not, are you using this, this terminology, but does that terminology have a proper function? That's the point mm -hmm. of the language. Can we effectively communicate about the function of this behavior and mm -hmm. how to intervene upon it? Mm -hmm, so, right. you know, that's the relevant component. And we have to, you know, when we're talking about bird behavior, I think it can become very tempting to get away from that observable uh, uh, behavior in a way yeah. that may be deceptive um, yeah, for right. understanding. Extremely so. I mean, just look at any, like pretty much any, if you want to learn about say parrot body language, for example, look up any web page about it. And what you will have is like a picture of a bird doing something and saying, this bird thinks that this is fun or this bird doesn't want to do this or this bird is happy right. because, well, and it's like, yeah, no, that's, that's not how that works. Um, so, so yeah, um, I, I, I can't say more than I agree. I agree so much. I made a whole freaking website thing. Website, so. which <laughs> we're waiting for the website to go live because some live. have students, it is. Yes, I told you. Oh, it's just you? not finished, but oh, like, it's not finished. Oh, okay, all right. I mean, well, it's, it's up. It, it, it needs it needs a lot of proof proofing, and I still need to add stuff. But but it is there. And oh. well, excellent. So <laughs> I am going to start using it then because that's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like, here's here's the thing that I um want to want to talk about slash ask about because I do say things all the time. Um, and sometimes more or less facetiously, depending on the context, like for instance, Kaya just talks for the joy of talking. Right. And I, and, and I like she, what I mean, like, she's not trying to communicate with me. She's, she's just chattering. And what I mean by that is like, when she has these moments where she's just kind of repeating things, it's during a time in the day when she's not actively working towards food and she is comfortably kind of nestled so that looks like you know keel resting on the top of her feet with her feathers loose and be you know what i mean like yeah yeah yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so like she's 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 always chattering in these contexts of like it's not a time of day when she's working to get food or make a nest or whatever and she just sits there and she just sort of chatters and it, you know whatever so i say she talks for the joy of talking and and like I, the th where the kind of like place that I kind of emotionally sit on this is like we can talk about what are the actual reinforcers we don't actually know what's reinforcing the behavior um, we don't actually know the motivation I'm a kind of implying I'm sort of like laying that on her but on a real world practical level if you if you like nitpick that and I and I nitpick has like a kind of a pejorative term that I, I don't or like a negative connotation that I don't mean? mean but like yeah but yeah. like if you sort of like try to like say that to a client or to just like a random person they're like oh my god shut up I don't care like I don't fucking care like you know what I mean like I just want to say yeah. that my bird is doing it for the joy of doing it so yeah. but like if I say that to a colleague I can't tell you how many times I get corrected and and so like here's where I sit with that is like how much do we as professionals have a responsibility to like speak accurately in those situations when we're describing behavior because like, because it's our job and how much are we allowed to sometimes just be like, my bird is being an asshole and I hate him today, <laughs> you know what I mean? And this is sort of something that I sort of like vacillate on quite a bit. That it is a really, really yeah. important point. It's a really important conversation. And I, I, I will, I, I'll give you a little bit of history here um, to, to start, which is, so I, you know, I come from an academic background and, uh, and you know, I was, uh, I was an undergrad at University of Florida. 
Um, so I was taking classes with Hank Pennypacker and Tim Hackenberg, who are both amazing uh, behavior analysts, helped mentored me as an undergraduate. Uh, you know, I had multiple classes with both. I was one of uh, Hank's uh, uh, proctors. So precision teaching stuff, I can get into fluency and all the standard acceleration chart and all that stuff, which I'm not going to, because um, that's a tangent as much as I love tangents. Um, but the point being is in that environment, regardless, it, so it's an academic environment that can already be aversive to what you're supposed to know and what how you're supposed to talk. And then behavior analysts had a long history um, and particularly as I was an undergrad of being incredibly punishing, of correcting language. That is how uh, a big part of how I learned to talk the talk of behavior analysis. So if I said, you know, if you were talking about behavior and you said, well, and then I reinforce the dog, you know, uh, the entire class would erupt and be like, you know, you reinforce, the, reinforce dog, the, the dog, right? So, right. And, and I still make these little jokes here and there. And I try right. to not, I try to make them jokes and not aversive, but the point right. being is, there was so much correction, you know, so if you talked about delivering a reinforcement, somebody would, you know, you never deliver reinforcement as a contingency, you deliver reinforcers, that's the consequence, you know, right. and, you know, if you use reinforcer without an empirical demonstration, et cetera, I can go on and on about the specifics of the language, but it was incredibly aversive. And I've tried to make it clear that it should not be aversive. In it, uh, uh, like we should not be training people. These are approximations that mm -hmm. we're working towards. And I see people still get frustrated that they don't, that they're not using the proper term. And I, I mean, I can see it regardless of whether it's with talking to you. It's part of why I don't want to be aversive for professionals, right. even talking to other professionals, right? We should be right. shaping our language, not correcting it. Right. Um, if we're living by our 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 principles right mm -hmm. so right. i don't have a great answer is the simple point other than you know i like to ask people like hey i see you struggling you know with how can i make this easier for you like i do this mm -hmm. with students all the time you know if it, it, what do you like and and i i i do a lot less of of tacting what that necessarily is and a lot more of just rewarding when I see when they say the thing the right way and try to be rewarding and then you know mm -hmm. just may can we get there but it, there's another component to that which is how do them how do people talk to their clients so this is just between professionals to professional and right. I, I can argue all day about terminology and the importance of it and what words are good or not good we saw some of that yesterday which was fun um so uh but uh nonetheless now we're talking about how do we talk to people that are not behaviors as well so we're not averse so right. I'm, I'm going on. Well, so way. I think that I should probably like restate what I said, because I think it's a no brainer that if your client is like, you know, my bird chatters for the joy of chattering, you're not going to be like, no, -uh, we need to like, you know, so what I meant by that is yeah. um, we, we know that we don't do that to clients. Right. Um, but what I, what I have struggled with is where do I do it? Cause if I'm, to, if I'm like just having a conversation with colleagues, and I'm not actually trying to like figure out what this bird's behavior is. I'm going to just kind of you talk. Yeah. Like I'm just going to like say things, right? And yet still in that context, so, like I've had many, many professionals, more bird people than other species, by the way, be like, <laughs> bird mm. no, I, I feel like we talk about behavior, Emily, you know, it's like, come on, like, you know what I mean when I say this and we're not actually like, analyzing this animal's behavior right now we're just chatting so that's where yeah. i think i'm yeah and I'm... i think to me that's that's like the most important thing like what why are we having this conversation and what will the effects of this conversation be like right um are we just chatting about something and we both know that i don't really know why the bird does this like it sort of seems like she just likes it whatever it's it's not really important we're not trying to figure that out right now right. um so it's it's just like the best way I have to talk about something that really isn't super important, then it's that's kind of fine. shorthand, right? Yeah, it's, it's, shorthand. it's like if I'm using shorthand. that to, right, if I'm using that to contrast between Bayou, who, who only speaks when he's 
deliberately trying to communicate something, that's the shorthand way to say there's a difference between, you know, the the context in which those that human language occurs in those two birds, right? Yeah. Oh, I get terribly anthropomorphic about these things as I'm talking loosely. And I'm, I was doing it earlier when I was talking about- When you, you said know, that all birds are dumb, like 200 times. That, that, <laughs> I, you know what? I have not said that in this chat. So um, well, and you are making, that is a that is a, a private joke, Emily. We are I'm only, outing you. Yeah, we're only <laughs> supposed to talk about dumb burbs in private. <laughs> but oh, I shamed you. Right. <laughs> shaming me now. Um, no, but, so so but I was talking about this bird loving me, this bird hating me, and I right, do right. Think that, I, so there is, I mean, I am anthropomorphic, you know, of, so I, I, I have different, also, I should say, I have different language, uh, uh, language sets, depending on who I'm talking with, and what oh, we're, you know, for different contexts, right, so this is important as well, um, but so we will jokingly, um, I mean, I make constant anthropomorphic comments <laughs> right, about right, all right. animals, all of them. Right, right. Uh, so, uh, and I talk about, yeah, that animal, you know, like, oh yeah, that, that bear hates you. Oh yeah, 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 that bear <laughs> kill you. And I'm, right. I'm making these jokes and comments and it's important to have that, you know, um, one of these, in one of these virtual chats we had, um, you know, a few months ago where uh, Ava and hey gosh, Stephanie, you're going to have to, am I saying Bertelsen? Am I, did, tell me how to. If you want to be real Swedish, but yeah, that, um, you're saying I, I feel okay. bad for even like I, we're, we won't talk about my problem with pronunciation of all things, right? I so, mean, um, but well, Jerry, would you, you like me to say something words from a foreign language totally perfectly well so yeah. i so yeah. i listen I to my perfect like, english so i i have, have really good english so i will just say I'm this done. you know i majored in linguistics 20 years ago so things might have changed between now and then but when i was a linguistics major what we learned is that um there's like this this critical language period just like a critical socialization period that's like 18 months to, to eight years I think if I remember correctly and during that time it's not just like how your brain learns information but it's also how your mouth is shaped like your yeah. soft palate and oh. like the movements the micro movements that your tongue <laughs> learns to make so it's so it is actually like it's not anybody's fault that they can it, they cannot really perfectly imitate another like pronounce another language because like sure, your sure. mouth and your tongue isn't shaped that way. You well, missed the I, on that one. I I don't even need I won't talk about the amount of like having to go to speech therapists and speech pathologists that I had to do as a child as well. And I only and I, I say this public I try. I try to be open about this now, and I try to be public about this. But really, I mean, I spent most of my life. Uh, hiding the fact that I was dyslexic because mm -hmm. when, and that's very common for people that are dyslexic to, yeah. to know that, that you are treated as somehow being dumb. And I, and right. I like to say it now, I like to let people know, because I think a lot of people go, dude, you're a doctor, you know, and <laughs> that kind of thing. And like, I, I, it's very few times in my life that I've had somebody actually you know, treat me as if I was not smart. And yet it was a fear for me. So I only imagine what it can be like for other people that, that are dyslexic at yeah. some level, you know, that, that aren't, I was always treated like one of the smartest kids in the room and I was afraid of being treated dumb. Right. So, um, yeah. you know, yeah. and I, I would not acknowledge it. I would not be open, but nonetheless, so uh, that's an aside, but it's in, it's important. I like to be pub. I like to be open about that and public about that because you will see me. Say, and I have terrible times. I, I I have no idea how to pronounce any word that I see on paper if I've never if I've never heard it, and I have to memorize yeah. it. So I have to see. Yeah, I have I have an auditory yeah. processing disorder, so yeah. I have to see something spelled out in IPA in the International Phonetic Alphabet for me to be able to hear it correctly. Yeah. So that's an added layer of weirdness. Is like. I, and that's how I learned, actually, like, that's how I learned languages in college when I was, you know, a linguistics major and you have to learn languages. I would, like, literally 
look up everything in IPA and then I could pronounce it because I yeah. couldn't hear it before I saw it. Well, I, 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 I know this is not this is not bird particular and we're, we're <laughs> We just veered way off track. I'm it, but and, and the language, because we were going, uh, so I was mentioning Ava and and mentioning language, and she had this this right. brilliant point that she made um, in the you know when we had the the uh, Ava, Emily, and Hannah uh, chat. So what I've jokingly referred to as as our boy band name H plus E times three. Um, so, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, which we're doing, we're do we're going to do one of those for one of Hannah's, uh, we're doing one in February, a, a podcast that it's going to be H plus E times three again. Um, so, Enjoy that. Uh, but, uh, for, so for drinking from the toilet, we'll do a podcast, but Ava had a brilliant point that she, cause she was, you know, it was late night for her and she had her wine glass and she just said, this is going to be my discriminative stimulus for when I, you know, here's my behavior. And then here's not my behavior, you know. So when I want to speak <laughs> informally, here's the the non-behavior is the discriminative stimulus is I'm going to hold my wine glass. So and she made that so it made it, you know, we have a discriminative stimulus now attached to it. It made it context specific, um, which was w w really brilliant. It was it was beautiful, and I think it helped eliminate some of the the potential aversion of of dealing with when are we being required or being asked required is a terrible uh yeah. description there but when are we being asked or expected to talk more formally and and when can we get away with not doing that so right. and I, I i still find people get surprised when they hear me say things like that when i'm like oh that animal's a little shit you know right. or oh that animal hates you uh, that animal doesn't I, surprise <laughs> Right. Well, it doesn't surprise it's you. Not anymore. It doesn't surprise <laughs> yeah. me, but yeah, I yeah. Yeah, I, I, I totally see what I've had mean. people get actually offended when I've made comments like I'm a, I, I'm drawn to the jerks, which is true. Like when I worked at the sanctuary, which shall not be named, um, people would be like, you know, there'd be a do there'd be a dog in like the, our little admissions area, and they'd be like, oh, you need to put that dog in Emily's area because she's gonna love this dog because he's a total asshole. And then like at the next staff meeting, I'd be like, you guys, have you met such and such dog? I love him so much. He's amazing. And they're like, yeah, we knew. But people would get really offended when I would say, you know, I I love the assholes. I'm drawn to the assholes, or I'm drawn to the jerks. Um, right. Yeah, people get. That's why I asked the question because because where where do you draw the line, right? Like, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I I agree with that, and like I I use language like that all the time too, but I think I mostly do it like when I speak to people like you guys. Um, like I I don't say it as much if I speak to a client because I want to sort of set set an example, <laughs> but also yeah, I mean. I think I think it's a difficult question to to answer because it is so like it depends. <laughs> I'm right. sorry. Well, so I, somebody I think maybe was it um I can't remember who said oh, it. Oh, I didn't, I didn't get to say bye to Andy, but oh. Brit I'll okay, I'll I think it was him later. Brittany said something really that I was like, yeah, that's that's a really well articulated. Yeah, I've had a lot of Brittany, can you say it again? Because I can't remember, and I and it was like a long time ago. But it was like basically, if I'm I'm if we're talking about like actually trying to like suss out what's going on with the behavior, then we have we we have to speak as accurately as possible. And if we're just right. like chatting about things, you gotta yeah, hey, thank you. Um, how important it is for them to understand the actual behavior or not? Yeah, but yeah. so that's that's it. That's um, that I think for me is a really well articulated thing. Like, are we actually yeah. trying to figure this out or are we just chatting about yeah. it? Right? Yeah, that, that's exactly yeah. what I was trying to get at. And also do the people I'm, I'm talking to now, like we have the same sort of, we, we both have a basic understanding of the fact that I say that this animal is a, is a jerk, but I don't really like, that doesn't mean anything. Right. Uh, whereas right. if I would say that to, to someone that doesn't have the same sort of understanding of what we're talking about then they would sort of start drawing all of these uh, conclusions and and get all these ideas from me saying that that are probably not true or relevant or can even be harmful to to what we're trying to accomplish so yeah, right. yeah. Uh, so that's a great point Brittany that's exactly what I was like not really succinctly trying to say <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> language and and speaking like all behavior has function and context. <laughs> so, there and, you go. That, that, the wisdom. That's it. So what are we what are we trying to do when we say the things that we say? Like what what are we trying to what's what behavior what's in goal? someone else are we trying to change by saying this thing? And you know what one of the the funny things I'll say and I'll, I'll, I'll just say this briefly here is that um, I language both in my own damn head and what I say out loud is had, was one of those last bastions for me of where I often did not apply much of my own behavior analytic training in the sense of just, you know, well, I'm just wanting to have a conversation. And, you know, it's like, no, no, no. What are you trying to do with the things that you say? Right. You know, yes. and, and I really think about that now. And, it, and it's helped limit some of my over talk at times, which I still do plenty of. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I can, it, you know, it, 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 I, I love to talk. Uh, I don't, I didn't, you know, uh, I don't know where that comes from, but, uh, but nonetheless, and I, I try to recognize the proper setting and what the function of my current speaking is. Yes. Um, so important. Ass yeah. Assess that from other people and how they are responding. Yeah. Oh, this is something I've been thinking so much about lately too. Um, just like trying to, to actually catch myself and think about why do I want to even say this? Like why? Because I feel like, especially when it comes to these things and we all have this history of being corrected and we're supposed to use this language or we've learned that this thing is, is this way and not that way. And right. then we hear someone say something that's wrong. It's like instantly we're like, no, that's wrong. I have to, I have to say that this is wrong. Cause that, that's, right. that's not how we, we're not supposed to do that. It's like right. a very socially, socially <laughs> reinforced, like it, it has a lot to do with, with how culture works, which I'm yeah. not going to go into <laughs> any more specifics than that. But like, so, so just catching myself, uh, especially on, on social media when I'm like, oh my God, this is wrong. How can, and then like, I right. oftentimes nowadays do these things where like, I write, I type something out. And then I'm like, okay, I can't post this now. I have to wait five minutes and think about why do I want to say this? Like, what, right. what is the meaning? What's the function of this? Like, yeah. and oftentimes it's just that I got upset because I saw something that doesn't really rhyme with my idea about, or my like prediction of what, the, what should be, um, mm -hmm. which is just like, yeah, then why? I don't have to say that. Like, it doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> right. I, I, why does that matter? So, yeah. Um, I, it's it's particularly useful when, and I know it's weird for some people to to think of me as having because they they're used to hearing me be so formal, and it's like, and they don't hear me like around my family or my old friends, and so right. for when they think of you know oh you have different language sets, and then they all realize too it's like oh you have code speak, you know, right. and they start realizing I'm like dude, it's like you don't get a name like Eduardo Jose Fernandez and and not have code speak okay man i grew up pretty traditional um but nonetheless um uh i'll leave it at i wanted to finish off here since we are we are at two hours um two, just over two hours and and just i don't know i know i don't <laughs> well, we talking. we don't i mean i'm just gonna stop the recording here in a, in, in, a, in a little bit but do we have any final bird thoughts um bird relevant thought we have covered so many things and the terminology stuff is so important too for now the funny, the funny thing is i don't think we actually like cover the, the no points that we meant to cover we but know. we covered we covered at least two of them we oh, did we? okay yeah and just just to add to that i was thinking um i'm gonna post a link to the the resource i was i just mentioned uh in the chat in case someone wants to take a look at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what Using I was going to. Amazing bird body language website. Yeah. So yeah. Um, let's add let's add links here in the chat to everyone, and uh, it would also help if you gave a little bit to Google that. You know, you don't have to give the full link, but so that because pe people aren't seeing the chat in video. Yeah. 
uh, if you just visit understandingparrots.com, then there's you can click your way into understanding parrot body language. Um, the good thing to, to keep in mind is that I haven't like it is it is public, so anyone can see it, but it's not like an officially launched thing yet. So there's a lot of like it needs uh, it needs a lot of editing. Uh, I'm still working on adding a lot of stuff, so it's not like it's not a finished complete thing, but um, it's it's still accessible and there's some some useful stuff on there. And my intention with it was to to move away from this what we were talking about earlier about. Uh, this behavior means that the bird thinks this um, yeah. and you'll see that it's divided into a, a lot of different parts so it's just like yeah. learning to yeah see what parts do good. think about what context because one thing that's tricky I think with parrots even more so than many many other common pets is that they have a lot of behavior that look very similar but occur in very different like combinations and, and situations. And like what happens after that behavior can be very, very different. Like it can be right. the difference between like, yeah, what, oh, yeah, like uh, a, a nice social interaction or getting a bloody hand, like, right. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of, yeah, how we <laughs> interpret things. It, it's an excellent site. I've I've had a lot of time uh, getting to spend uh, watching Stephanie present stuff in reference to it, and also getting to interact with early versions of it. So Which I appreciate I, it so much. I, it's awesome. I really enjoy it. Um, I do and uh, Emily, I don't know if you had a link or anything that you wanted to give uh, for people that. Do you have anything specific somewhere to go find you to find your book? How about oh, you? oh yeah, oh, our website? I was like, I don't have any bird related websites. <laughs> well, I don't have a website. What are you talking about? It's still behavior related. It's still enrichment related, and all of that is important. I right? totally forgot that like we have a, like an actual business and a book and everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, our. <laughs> I forgot I was a behavior professional for a minute. You started thinking you were just in another Stephanie and Eddie chat is what you just started. Right, I just stumbled into this chat with these professionals. I was like, hey guys, can I join in? Um, Yeah, so we actually do have a a business and the website is petharmonytraining.com. And um, if you want to look at the book, if you go to our website and click on the resources section, there's like a drop down menu that has the link to page about the book. And the book is called Canine Enrichment for the Real World, which has nothing to do with burbs, unfortunately. Dog wise makes me write about dogs instead of burbs. Dogs, dogs are just furry, non-flying burbs. They really okay. are. They really are. So uh, that, so yeah. And if you want to pop that link into the chat. Yeah, I can do that. that awesome. That's um, I think somebody was asking before about some of my publications and this is the only, the only, well, I mean, I guess I have a couple website, the only really relevant website and somewhere you can find all of my publicate or most of my publications. Um, if you go to my research gate profile, you can also, I think many of my publications are on my academia profile as well, but they're all, you know, these are uh, mostly peer reviewed publications, uh, and there's some stuff with penguins, as I mentioned, chickens, pigeons, ringneck doves. Um, here, there's the link. So if you go to, if you just search for me on, if you go to researchgate.net, which is a great website for finding academic profiles in general, if you're, you can get access to a lot of uh, papers that otherwise, so academic peer reviewed papers that otherwise wouldn't be publicly accessible. And if you search for Eduardo Fernandez, you'll find me there on researchgate.net, or there's the link right there. And you can see some of those. I was about to say, how many birds have I published papers on? I think four going on five species of birds. That's, I think, all I've got published publication wise. I don't have anything with I don't have anything with any of the passeriforms. I just had to think about that for a second. Mm-hmm. Columbiforms, um, the penguins, the Senecas forms, which um, you know are great. I don't 
why don't I have anything with owls either? That's on, on my to-do list to um, get a publication with owls. Since I do you have, have any on pit with parrots? I don't. I don't, but I'm, I'm I know. You know what? Honestly, like I adore I adore the citizens, but I'll tell you, uh, you know, they mystify me and I'm I'm not like I I'm very much looking forward to getting to see them in the wild and in, in Australia. Um, but I don't have a strong inclination to necessarily, like there's a lot of other birds ahead of that list than the citizens uh, okay. for wanting to work with. All Just right. because there's been so much, you know, and I love, and, and look, no, I, no, I, it's fine. It's fine. I know, I know. And I was going to say- unfriending you as we speak, it's fine. Right, right, right. Uh, uh, fair <laughs> enough. Um, I adore, I, I adore Irene Pepperberg. She's wonderful. I, um, like, she's great. I, I, I got to have dinner with her years ago, um, and she's uh, been amazing in, in interacting it with emails and things like that, but I'm not a big you know, animal cognition guy. Um, so uh, I'm very kind of old school behavioral um, when it comes to the behavior stuff and, uh, and most of my stuff, my applied animal stuff, which is 90 plus percent of everything is all welfare related. So, but I love seeing Irene's stuff and what she's done with her gray parrots um, and she's great, but I think there's the assumption often that if you're going to do something with citizens, there's going to be some component of animal cognition with it. Then again, I've done a lot of primate stuff. I mean, I've published stuff on like a half a dozen primates and people always look for, you know, well, where's that? I, I've had people try to force me into talking about um, gold mine tamarind stuff as, uh, well, where's, the, this is cognitive enrichment. I'm like, no, 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 it's not. It's just, it's enrichment. We'll talk about it as ex situ enrichment, but nonetheless, again, I'm. In a future conversation, or maybe after the recording has stopped, I would love to actually ask you some questions about these subcategories that people have for enrichment, like cognitive enrichment and environmental right. enrichment. Right. Um, I have so many questions about that, but I know we're like yeah. 12 over time. So like, yeah, no, no worries. I mean, not today maybe, but we got everything, I think. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and turn off the recording and we can sit here for a okay. little bit here, but thank you for everyone that's still watching this, that will yeah. be watching it via YouTube. Thank you for, for being here. Um, I, I think we, we publicly set our links. They're posted in our chat, which you can't see if you're watching this on YouTube. And uh, uh, for everyone that's actually here, we're going to keep chatting. But otherwise, um, yeah, this was awesome. So yeah. thank you, particularly Stephanie and Emily, for being here. Um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the video now. So say your bye. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, so.